Добрый день всем, уважаемые коллеги. Good afternoon. It's 2 p.m. and we are starting. And I would like to welcome everybody at this session. Meet you here in Moscow. It's a great honor for us to meet entrepreneurs from 153 countries. И задача нашей сегодняшней встречи. And today's meeting is to share the experience, our thoughts and ideas about how can we enhance the entrepreneurship spirit uh, in our countries with the help of regulating instruments and uh, streamlining the, uh, the regulation matters. You can make uh, loans accessible, you can train entrepreneurs, you can promote it, but you can do certain understandable procedures uh, to promote it. And uh, in Russia, probably you heard, we have this national entrepreneurship initiative ongoing with with the new entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs with officials worked out a certain platform and last year we pro uh, in doing business we improved by 20 positions and this initiative produced a number of very interesting observations and ideas about how state bodies respond to improvement of of business uh, medium and uh, how to improve them this uh, medium and we have a great experience from uh, Russian and f international experts who can share their experience and uh, I believe everybody will contribute to themselves to their companies for the state bodies as well and I would like to introduce our guest Vladim Zhigulin head head of the Department of Ministry of Economic Development of Russia Denis Mindalgas the head of the SME uh, department in Litva, Douglas Hilk, is a Finnish uh, counterpart on business support. And uh, we expect also Andrei Siganov from Central Anti-Monopoly Service. And he is coming to the table right now. Andrei, the seat is yours. And our format is as follows. Quite typical for such panel discussions. Every of our guests will have a word for seven, eight minutes and for some mini presentations on points of supporting business and the regulation options you believe are important today. And in course of this discussion, we'll have a certain deviations uh, and interactions. And then I will give the floor to the audience and, and who will ask uh, us uh, certain questions. And as we had four guests uh, and Vladimir Julian is first to leave us, unfortunately, because he participated in another forum, I give the word the floor to him first and because he has some very interesting figures and facts uh, on the regulation impacts uh, good afternoon dear colleagues first i would like to thank uh, for the opportunity to speak at such representative venue and uh, tell you about our vision and uh, approaches to how a business can be regulated as well as entrepreneurship activities and I am from the department which uh, submits uh, the uh, assessment of regulation impact. Therefore, I can uh, share with you uh, how our body of uh, regulation rules, uh, uh, regula rules and regulations affect uh, entrepreneurship activities. In 2010, our government has introduced a certain discipline or uh, what is called this is, uh, the impact assessment uh, on uh, of regulations. And uh, every bill, before it is approved, uh, should be analyzed uh, to the extent uh, how it can impact uh, the media if it is implemented. And there is nothing revolutionary in it. Uh, it's just an exercise, as usual, but uh, it wasn't uh, in existence before. And since we introduced this tool in the activities of our uh, authorities, it uh, immediately turned into revolutionary uh, changes. And the designers, the developers of uh, the bills of regulations now have to analyze the consequences of every decision every norm to introduce they need to address risks which may uh, stay or occur if uh, this or that uh, norm or law is put into effect and since that time just uh, less than four years uh, have passed uh, and uh, we already have certain uh, 
outcomes. And um, not only I will speak about the impact uh, of the regulation uh, 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 interventions, but I'll speak about the tendencies which exist uh, and which we outlined when uh, doing this work. And uh, the first thing I would like to pay attention to is the uh, huge body of regulations we have to work with. And not only we are involved, uh, those uh, rules and regulations which uh, are introduced uh, have certain effect on the entrepreneurship's life and, uh, and uh, the, the business media. Therefore, uh, since that time, uh, we have seen an annual increment of the number of uh, rules and regulations addressing different problems and issues. And uh, why it is so? Maybe it is related to the number of issues which are uh, kind of barriers uh, or problems. And maybe our legislators are getting more uh, intense in the efforts or just working more hard. But uh, as, as a result, uh, in my slide, you can see that uh, quite recently we have a serious increase of papers to analyze, and uh, especially the ministerial degrees, and, uh, uh, and then become not only the one, but at least a serious way of regulating the uh, business activities and their number dominates compared to all other rules and regulations. And uh, this uh, tidal wave of uh, regulations uh, complicates life for our officials because all our bodies, uh, ministers, uh, compete now in uh, number of uh, the regulations published. And uh, that can be a decelerating factor for business uh, because this number of regulations requires certain adaptation uh, and uh, it also ne uh, leads to revising their contractual obligations and commitments with the partners and as essentially this is one of the trends which negatively affects uh, the uh, the uh, the perception of people as uh, of any law which uh, uh, now is uh, 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 just assessed or uh, accepted not just the final uh, rule, which is stable. Uh, and, uh, therefore, because uh, to uh, many cases, uh, these regulations uh, serve the interests of uh, state borders. And uh, another uh, if event which we witness now is that a number of papers uh, also stipulate the conditions for uh, rules and regulations to be published. And not always they are followed. Not always we see a f clear logic in uh, uh, writing, de developing these uh, rules and uh, regulations. And uh, quite often, uh, it's very hard to clean uh, these uh, regulations from some harmful uh, details or uh, or potential impacts uh, which are not uh, desired. And therefore, um, I, I would say that more than a third of the papers we recognize as harmful or uh, excessive or and uh, because of the reasons I stipulated earlier. And what shall be done about it and uh, how to improve it? This is not an easy issue. and. Uh, uh, there should be some a simple and uh, complicated approaches uh, which we have already keep in mind and some of them were made public and they're not something which can be called uh, revolutionary or extraordinary on the other hand these uh, solutions uh, nobody were actually perceived seriously from anybody and uh, the first thing to note I uh, forget. Uh, just uh, one another point. Uh, in process of developing the rules and regulations, uh, uh, which uh, affect uh, the business activities, uh, need to be limited, uh, and uh, and one of the conditions for them should be 
it should be uh, follow the pin principle of one in one out it means that the develop this developer or the law should set up certain commitments or conditions for business activity shall cancel some another uh, barrier which pre previously uh, existed uh, to avoid uh, building up a barrier on uh, activities and uh, there should be another principle to follow one uh, in to off uh, when a developer shall not only introduce new uh, requirements and then modifying some certain uh, uh, demands or requirements they need to cancel uh, to by introducing a new rule it should cancel two previous ones and this can preserve not only the balance of uh, the limitations for any activity but gradually decrease the number of uh, limitations and another measure which in our opinion can be quite effective and which are well known internationally and this uh, concern the this, uh, transitional periods of uh, situations and now they become a common practice for many regulators when gradually uh, the requirement of transitional periods uh, shall become not uh, something unnatural or artificial uh, uh, now everybody shall understand that business and bodies require certain time for adaptation for uh, in transiting to new rules of the game they need also uh, to uh, uh, reset their contracts, uh, to revise their business plan, and so on. And uh, in a number of uh, positions, uh, we see that the transitional periods ha is uh, set, has been set, and we believe this is kind of achievement of of us, of ours. And uh, so far, uh, they work mainly in the field of technical regular requirements and um, another point I forgot about very important thing the terms of coming into effect uh, with regard to business and um, here uh, many times we discussed uh, an expert community in this uh, media that uh, new rules and regulations which uh, determine business uh, activities uh, shall be introduced at a limited uh, number so there should be one or two it, during a fixed uh, period of time in order to give the uh, business community to prepare for uh, these novelties and the transitional period shall not exceed six months and this is uh, a certain concept uh, which is quite debatable but we believe that uh, 1st of February and 1st of se September, this is what we uh, are looking for. And uh, in, in Great Britain is the same, and Poland is from 1st of Ju uh, J January and then 1st of July, uh, when all the new rules come into effect. And then uh, there is some experimental uh, area, uh, an issue which required very weighted approach, uh, very uh, precise. Uh, uh, implementation and which is not easy to uh, carry out because it relates to a serious body of uh, norms and regulations to adapt and the essence of this principle is that the most difficult public uh, social relations uh, can be uh, regulated only after a certain pilot projects are launched uh, which are limited in time for one year or some 18 months or limited by a territory and uh, knowing that uh, Russia is a federal uh, country and this uh, has a certain uh, uh, specificity but I believe after certain discussions we can come to quite a comfortable way of introducing any novelties and business relations and uh, another thing to, to point out uh, assessment of, uh, of the impact of uh, new rules and regulations this is a modified assessment and or evaluation the essence of which is uh, to come 
again to assess any law or rule or regulation in a number of years uh, because quite often we have very good intentions to, to introducing one laws but in a number of months or due to certain mistakes or miscalculations a law uh, in being applied can happen to be quite different from what it was expected from it and uh, therefore we believe that one of the review of such documents uh, uh, a process of it shall be just to return to uh, reviewing these uh, regulations uh, and after the certain period of time and uh, by weighing all the, the impacts of it. Uh, there is another institution which allows us to assess uh, different effects uh, of uh, regulations and law concerns uh, ministerial uh, orders uh, or decrees and uh, the Ministry of uh, Economy has is authorized to do so and we take this uh, ministerial orders and there is a huge number of them and uh, assess them for the subject of excessive barriers to business and uh, then we submit certain uh, proposals to the Ministry of Justice uh, to cancel to repeal certain uh, decrees or orders and this procedure works and uh, we encounter certain difficulties and resistance of uh, agencies and ministers when they don't want to cancel certain papers but uh, still I would like to draw attention that this uh, approach works but it is not that uh, powerful, it's that effective, and therefore it's very hard to analyze its uh, efficiency. Therefore, this set of these measures uh, doesn't create as, uh, exactly uh, the conducive conditions for entrepreneurship activities in Russia, but still it can minimize establishment at the legislative level certain difficult uh, in implementation regulations uh, which can actually to, uh, det uh, deteriorate or, uh, the situation for business. Or, and and uh, therefore, I would like to also emphasize uh, that not everything which I highlighted today is uh, indisputable. And uh, this event is, serves us um, uh, as a chance to uh, debate these things to refine uh, uh, what uh, we currently propose and maybe give us certain examples of uh, to what extent the, our current practices are acceptable in our internationally and how to streamline uh, uh, our approaches and thank you very much my colleagues and i'm ready to take your questions И э, я бы хотел э, наших гостей из Литвы, из Финляндии спросить, э, есть ли в ваших странах некая формальная процедура оценки воздействия нормативного акта, если какое-то государственное ведомство предлагает то или иное регулирование, которое повлияет на бизнес, существует. Well, basically what I heard uh, from my Russian uh, colleague, uh, uh, we follow the same uh, procedures and steps and uh, uh, doing business uh, global ranking that uh, has been uh, compiled annually by the World Bank uh, is a good uh, action plan and uh, recommendation list uh, in order to improve uh, business environment and uh, business climate for SMEs. And uh, in case of Europe, uh, uh, we have uh, a special uh, document with a bit uh, more detailed uh, recommendations uh, for each member state. It's called uh, Small Business Act. Uh, it was adopted uh, six years ago and uh, each country needs to report uh, what improvements uh, have been achieved, uh, uh, what legislative measures or other uh, measures have been uh, adopted. So. Uh, 
once you asked about uh, a um, evaluation of uh, impact on business uh, uh, by some uh, new laws, uh, we have a separate uh, department in the Ministry of Economy, uh, which uh, main task is to coordinate uh, analysis of uh, this impact uh, uh, together with some other ministries and uh, also evaluate the cost of uh, on business on uh, for, for different uh, new regulation and uh, new laws and um, when I was coming to this uh, uh, workshop uh, I was uh, well also a bit confused because uh, regulation is considered uh, well very boring subject but uh, basically when you go down to specific uh, issues, uh, uh, you see that uh, we talk about uh, very concrete uh, and specific questions like uh, access to capital, and this could include uh, helping, uh, mm, for example, to create uh, guarantee schemes uh, so that uh, it's much easier for small businesses to get uh, loans uh, from banks. Uh, or uh, recently in Lithuania, we had uh, launched the Venture Capital Fund for seed investments, and uh, this was also a new uh, thing for our market. And uh, now uh, the fund of about uh, 20 million euros uh, has already uh, you know, dispersed, invested uh, about 2 million uh, euros uh, in uh, one year time. And uh, uh, our startup ecosystem, technology-based startup uh, ecosystem, looks much different just because of this uh, uh, decision. So. Uh, I guess that, uh, well, we have uh, a few other things that uh, we can me mention and, uh, uh, let's say, it's launching a business, uh, uh, yeah, that's one of the criteria that is being measured uh, both uh, by doing business with World Bank uh, and by Small Business Act. Uh, and uh, for quite some time, uh, you know, you had to go to your regular way, get uh, a permit from a landlord. Uh, uh, go to the notary to uh, sign uh, the statute of your company, pay the share uh, capital, and then uh, wait, uh, I don't know, several days uh, uh, to get your company registered. And uh, since uh, also last year, uh, you can do it online. Uh, and it's not only in Lithuania, but in some uh, other EU member states. And it just takes, uh, you know, uh, much less uh, time. And uh, this is also the result of, uh, you know, improving uh, business regulation and improving a business uh, climate. And we can go uh, deeper into the subject and uh, also talk about, uh, you know, other stages of business development uh, and, uh, you know, like, uh, getting uh, construction permits or getting electricity, you know, registering the property. These are also things uh, that are being measured. And uh, despite the fact that Lithuania is ranked uh, 17th, like 1-7, 17th, uh, overall uh, in this global uh, doing business list, but uh, in terms of uh, getting access to electricity, we are still something like 50. So, uh, you know, uh, you have a big picture of things that you can do and uh, you have your priorities and try to, you know, initiate uh, changes, uh, try to react to business association uh, requests and, uh, you know, help uh, business grow. Спасибо, uh, Денис. Dennis, thank you very much. You mentioned this online services. So I'm the head of the workshop related to simplifying procedures for register registering businesses. So one of the problems that we faced in the course of registering business online, that's the authentication process. Before you apply for it, you don't have an ID or you don't have an electronic signature, so it is very difficult to set up an online service which would not require showing up in the ministry. So how is that resolved in your country? Do all your people have electronic IDs? How does it work? Just uh, recently I, I've read uh, a message uh, posted by uh, a former managing director of our investment promotion agency. She resigned, but uh, she was uh, writing something about uh, electronic solutions uh, implemented by the state and usually it's just uh, you know many failures and uh, lots of money but uh, in the case of uh, e-signature also we have been uh, having uh, numerous projects but uh, uh, commercial banks uh, have been uh, the ones that uh, really changed uh, the situation and uh, uh, now uh, we can access uh, public services like uh, tax inspectorate uh, 
uh, welfare uh, department, uh, also company register using uh, the authentication uh, service uh, that is linked uh, to our bank account. Uh, that's one of mm. the solutions and uh, it really, of course, it took time, but uh, I don't know, for at least uh, four or five years, I guess, uh, we already have uh, uh, the system that uh, you can use. And uh, I think it's inevitable because uh, it saves uh, huge amounts of money for everybody, for the government as well, uh, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I think the solution with the bank accounts is a very graceful solution, I would put it. And providing everyone with electronic signature, I think uh, this issue is very hot for Russia. One of my business colleagues attended the business conference in Estonia related to online services. And the head of IT department of Estonian government was telling about these services, and all oh, the audience was excited. But then he said, "But all these solutions are for a country which do not have more than two million people. If you have more than two million people, you will have to think of some other solutions." Thank you very much, Daniel. Andre, you are the next speaker. So, so what is the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service doing to simplify life for small businesses? I understand that Federal Anti-Monopoly Service has got a lot of questions about small business and some, sometimes very small companies fall into the area of responsibility of the Anti-Monopoly Service. So sometimes those individual entrepreneurs form cartels. But anyway, Anti-monopoly service plays an immense part in simplifying business environment. Thank you very much. I would like to note that these companies fall into the area of our responsibility not entirely for nothing. That normally happens when they violate anti-monopoly laws or other laws which are in the responsibility of anti-monopoly service. So we are charged with the responsibility to supervise the abidance by these laws. But this is not the point of my presentation. I would like to start with telling you in a bit more detail about our role. Yes, tell us about how not to get into the uh, area of attention of your ministry. Well, there are professional lawyers who provide this consultancy. So the point of our meeting and the point of this conference is to, ex to foster, uh, foster the business environment and, and entrepreneurial environment. If you take a look at the problem from the biological perspective, then you would see not <coughs> there is no sustainable ecosystem without a competition. There must be competition between the species inside the ecosystem. And when be the best species gain certain advantages, that makes the system more sustainable. One thing is talking about the virgin woods, and another thing is talking about the garden. And t today we have definitely come to a conclusion that state should be the part of this ecosystem. Like in our case, Probably in some other countries in the world, the libertarian economical principle, they bear fruit, but this is not in our case. So in our case, state operates in this ecosystem playing different roles. A state sells something. They, so it sells something, it buys something. It also works as a gardener. Cuts the rotten, cuts the rotten branches. Yes, or pave, or, or, or put the territory under the tarmac. Uh, yes, if you need to set to build a road there, and <clears throat> to build a road for trucks that would transport fertilizers for the ecosystem. But the state is also establishing rules for all other members of this process to abide by, not fight with each other. So I think that the rules of competition is the cornerstone of this ecosystem that makes it sustainable. Why am I talking about this? I'm talking about it because in many cases it happens such that you, <clears throat> market share is converted into market power and market might. And big companies who operate 
on, in a certain market, they adhere to scorched earth tactics. They do not leave the room, no room at all to small business and don't leave any room to medium business. So they, they do not look at these companies as part of their business. They just look at these companies as, at, as spin-off opportunities or outsourcing opportunities. And this is a wrong look at these companies. We all understand which role small and medium business is playing, and we know how it should evolve and what rules it should abide by. Getting back to competition rules in Russia, those rules have been set up more than 20 years ago, and they are based on profound Western experience. And these rules are stipulated by the Constitution of the Russian Federation, which is also an important point to note. These rules have been dynamically developing as the, as the laws in adjacent areas are also developing. And we have an extensive practice of applying this law. And this law is fully in line with the, with the benchmarks and with the international analogs. When we talk about the fact that our competition law is broader than similar law in any other country, we should note that this competition law also affects state authorities and people in these state authorities. Talking about state authorities, I mean federal authorities and municipal authorities. We have no right to use sanctions against the bodies which are mentioned in the Constitution of the Russian Federation, like the president and the uh, the parliament, for example, but our law is formed in such a way that we spend half of our time supervising the activities of our governmental people and public servants. So, and these are the people who should, who are tasked with responsibility to put fertilizers into the ground so that that ground is converted into sustainable ecosystems. So when, when we review these cases, most of these cases are not about big companies or cartels between big and medium companies. These are cases against public servants. So the cases when they introduce acts or regulations which limits competition, which in, in, in its own turn violates the anti-monopoly law, and these acts create create favors for certain companies. They close markets for competition. And in recent five or seven years, we've got to this three or four, three or four thousand cases a year. Now we also have to supervise the state purchasing activity. So whatever the state purchases, we should monitor. So we, we, we can fairly confidently say that we have enough power to perform both these tasks. But unfortunately, we would say that we still have 30 or 45,000 complaints on every year about the way tenders are set up. And in most cases, it is not about deals between the companies how to win a tender. It is mostly about the fact that public servants have structured or doctored the tender documentation in such a way that certain companies, small businesses, are not allowed to participate in the tender, or companies which are from a different region are not allowed to participate. So somehow they protected the tender from other companies which have not made any favors to these public servants. So we have a lot of these cases, and more than half of these complaints are checked and, and specified, uh, are verified, and they are found to be correct. But the Russian Federation is, is a big country, and it is quite rich country. So in the local budget, there is enough money to support 
medium and small businesses. And our task is to make sure that these mechanisms are transparent enough and these instruments and mechanisms are accessible from the, from the side of entrepreneurs. And here we, have, we also have an extensive practice and enough statistic data about possible actions of public servants. Like, for example, only one newspaper which is circulated in the rural area publishes notice about available governmental support to small businesses. There are cases when public servants change the rules of granting these funds to small business, and in some cases, these 97 or 99 percent of these funds end up being granted to one person or one company, and everyone else is getting a share of three or one percent. And we do, we do think it is wrong, and these cases should be stopped, and there should be law used against these people. And another point I wanted to make, Vadim told us a very interesting story about assessing the impacts of regulations in Russia. But he should have focused your attention on two more things. One thing is transparency. We all need to understand that decision whether certain regulation is in line or not in line with the rules used in regulation assessment or whether this law sets limitations to, in, to entrepreneurs. These laws are not passed by, a, by Mr. Mizulin, but these laws are passed and are formed as the result of a public assessment. All these laws are made public on a website called regulation.ru, and every person who is interested in making sure that state authorities work efficiently in this area, every citizen has got right to make comments about certain things. Let's say point 25 of this the directive limits my authority. I want this point being clarified or checked or dropped off the list. I think this is the, the, the best approach the best approach to establish interaction between authorities and business and society. This is transparent interaction, which has certain limits in terms of time frames. And this discussion inevitably lead to having a document of improved quality. Or in some cases, these documents are just not approved. Finally, if they do not meet requirements of entrepreneurs. And another thing I wanted to mention, we believe that assessment of the impact of regulating authorities should include assessment of the impact on competition, because competition is a vital part of our business, and we are not suggesting it for the sake of suggesting. We are suggesting it on the basis of best available practices in the world. Because organizations for co economic cooperation and development have all worked out documents and procedures which help governmental authorities to impact whether a certain regulation impacts business in a whole or particularly competition whether certain regulation impacts these aspects on the global market or certain regional markets. Andrei, thank you very much. This was Andrei Siganov of Federal Anti-Monopoly Service. I have a question to the studio. Can you raise your hands who those represent Russia and have business in Russia? And the host uh, participants. And uh, please, among the hosts, who actually saw regulation gov are you and so left some comments. I see five. So officials are not counted. OK, excellent. I would say that we have very advanced audience. It's a Congress, those people which are quite emotionally involved and uh, those who are interested in this uh, 
uh, environment, and uh, I am also uh, part, uh, uh, designing this uh, roadmap, and uh, this is still not an uh, interface and not uh, the presentation which we would urge every entrepreneur to come and to leave a comment and highlight certain uh, uh, certain points because this is uh, very bookish and legal legalese uh, and um, I don't want to protect and uh, uh, and promote somebody else's site in the internet but uh, I would like to say the following great that in uh, in your official site there are a few pic pictures and video or the graphs, there is a, just a language and the, those who can read, uh, they understand. But I believe that the businessmen should be more if, uh, active in doing it. But look, look at this in other fields, when tender sector, there the, the majority, uh, most of those claims uh, are generated not by us and not by other uh, state bodies or who or supervisors. They're generated by the businessmen themselves, and they're quite active. They l uh, look, they laugh at some golden uh, trinkets uh, which uh, officials buy. They just uh, become horrified by uh, items which are bought for $100 instead of three, and uh, they are surprised that a tremendous uh, a project can be implemented in one day. They cannot understand also why a bridge through a huge river can be of zero value uh, if uh, the, they, uh, the, it is in the tender. So when they talk about money, when we talk about specific contracts where businessmen can and will participate, they have a very quite uh, in a lot of interest, and you don't need to inspire them to comment. And but the uh, language of law is quite dry, and sometimes uh, people think, okay, somebody should uh, craft uh, this uh, language, and they have no idea that soon this uh, language will affect your life. And uh, this is uh, the simple explanation of uh, the feedback at uh, uh, regulation.ru and uh, probably Andre will respond. I actually, uh, you, you are quite right. It was uh, up to the point and uh, just a few uh, points to mention. Uh, since our site was established, uh, we actually saw an actual revolution. Until recently, the documents which can be easily found and uh, downloaded and shared, they were not even accessible. And uh, now the task is not just uh, discuss certain provisions, and uh, of course we can uh, uh, debate every point of But Andre mentioned one thing. On the one uh, hand, it is quite a dry, uh, uninteresting language, but once it is of interest to our users, they can immediately identify those provisions. And say, a law on Ministry of uh, Education for new uh, schools, driver school, there are 1,550 comments. Uh, that was a very painful issue. And, uh, so often. and this was, uh, once it was a notification that this document is being drafted, then immediately caused response. And this Ministry of Education drafted this document. Ministry of uh, Justice saw certain discrepancies and returned it. Uh, and uh, now we see this uh, picture when transparency, maximum transparency, is achieved thanks to this uh, institution. We, as for the, our site, we can debate at, li at length about its, its interface, its kind of convenience, uh, and uh, we recognize uh, the shortcomings, but ideologically, and uh, the as from the essence uh, point, uh, we are supported by everybody as for the, its improvement and its adaptation. I don't see any problem in it. We have a department which is actually enhancing and working with this information part and with it building up the resource. And uh, I believe that all these kind of uh, shortcomings will be rectified quite soon. And another point which uh, our uh, uh, 
a colleague from a federal anti-monopoly agency. He said uh, that uh, it has been debated for quite a long time whether to introduce or not introduce certain regulations. Some people uh, oppose it, and they say competition is not a reason. It is a consequence. It's an effect of quality regulation, and competition as a fact it is uh, during a development stage it's hard to feel hard to touch yeah, but those which want the competition they say no dear colleagues uh, the the law has to establish comfortable relations for business and uh, conducive uh, uh, it's media and uh, and uh, this is a point we need to uh, return uh, to it should be recurrent in our discussion because there are a lot of arguments crying contra uh, um, and probably we'll find an acceptable solution quite soon. Thank you very much, Vadim, as a contribution to this uh, regulation. That are you? I believe that the experience is good, and our European colleagues probably can confirm it. YouTube and. Uh, uh, Twitter account is also quite fascinating, and I, I enjoy reading this uh, nice with humor uh, comments and uh, something you click, and then you find the essence of truth, and then you understand that uh, the people read it and they are interested to wo follow the activities of state uh, regulators, and I, I believe it is a great achievement in itself. And um, Andre uh, Tapio now, he heads the Alta Center of Entrepreneurship. Can you tell us how it is actually organized and how in Finland, uh, with uh, knowing that this kind of socialist oriented countries with a very high commitment of states uh, in social field, uh, the, the a small business don't have sometimes resources to pay these big salaries and uh, how to make uh, this uh, media for business more efficient, uh, how to encourage business in Finland. In Finland. Yeah, uh, let's see if uh, or what kind of role I can take in this discussion because of course I'm coming from quite different angle compared to my uh, colleagues here. So uh, uh, I'm the person or the, my team uh, more or less try to find a way around all the regulation we have in Finland and the legislation as well to get the entrepreneurship uh, promoted and uh, going. So um, I come from the Helsinki area, which undeni undeniably is probably one of the hot spots in the Baltics or Nordics at the moment when it comes to entrepreneurship. And um, Aalto University and Aalto Center for Entrepreneurship um, uh, has some role at least to play with that. Uh, startup sauna, slash app campus, a uh, few uh, other things as well, at some point have been uh, part of my organization there. So um, I would say we are probably doing uh, more things right than wrong at the moment. Uh, it's definitely a very uh, complex uh, sort of a equation to solve. And um, the regulative part uh, is, is definitely uh, always an issue uh, in every country, and, and the issues are different. Uh, one, one thing we actually discussed uh, prior to the panel here uh, was also the definition of uh, SME. Uh, especially in the European Union, uh, I think we run into the trap that uh, uh, we talk about SMEs when we talk about uh, startups or uh, early stage growth startups especially, and vice versa as well. So uh, uh, the EU uh, is pushing forward different, sometimes very good initiatives uh, to promote uh, high growth startups, uh, but then uh, they run some kind of impact report and they analyze the whole SME. Uh, area, which basically is totally wrong because most of the SMEs are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, maybe even family businesses, uh, uh, bakeries, uh, some kind of, a, uh, let's say, uh, metal industry companies providing or subcontracting uh, uh, something uh, to the bigger companies. And the regulation and the requirements for those kind of companies are totally a uh, different issue uh, to what uh, startups or growth startups uh, who are aiming for international markets uh, are looking for. And of course, the, the, the areas are there, uh, it depends on corporate tax rate, 
um, is one one element, of course, uh, you can play with. But uh, uh, to be a, bit, a little bit provocative, uh, you could say that uh, the corporate tax rate could be 100 percent because the startups don't make any profits anyways in the first three, four years in most cases. So uh, that doesn't necessarily support uh, a lot the, the growth part, even if you lower the corporate tax rate, which we have actually done in Finland. It was a very good move for the uh, other SME companies, but uh, for the spin-off or, or the startup company side, uh, it has very uh, low impact. Then uh, we've actually now then also implemented certain uh, 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 incentives for business angels uh, uh, to support or invest in, uh, in startup companies so they can get some tax breaks. Of course, that's very good again for the startups, but has very little to do with some of the uh, SME companies. Um, so uh, the, the startup companies, if we now focus on those, uh, in Finland, of course, we have now a very uh, nice lineup. Uh, companies like Robio, Supercell, uh, MySQL, uh, uh, then Robotics, uh, um, the list goes on and on. So um, uh, I would say that the regulation part, of course, uh, puts some, I would say, uh, uh, breaks on some of the issues, but if the business case holds and the company and the team and the people especially are thriving for their business, uh, we can always find a way around or through or uh, the, uh, play with the regulation. Uh, at least at the moment, I don't think that in Finland we are in a position that uh, the, uh, you could really claim the fall of your business on regulation. Uh, it, it's, uh, you have to look into the mirror or, or uh, do something else uh, to find the reason there. And um, I would say the flexibility is, is one key word when we talk about uh, the, uh, the regulation part and then uh, startups. Because startups in many cases are, are very uh, thin on resourcing, funding and so forth. So they, they need to uh, develop very, I would say, uh, fast and, and flexible ways of uh, adjusting to the changes. Uh, in their business or in their funding. And um, I, as long as the regulatory or the legisl legislative part doesn't uh, prohibit that kind of moves, uh, then uh, I, I think we are in a good position. Uh, then what comes to the uh, side of like state involvement on, on funding uh, the companies and so forth, um, well, even like in my organization, we, we spin out uh, all the university research on, on startups and also, of course, we do licensing. And we use public funding uh, instruments uh, as part of that. So uh, definitely there is a role and place for uh, state funding. Uh, and the most likely, or the, uh, in my own books, uh, the, the best area is in the early stage, pre-seed seed funding. That's an area where the private sector uh, seems to shy away quite easily. But uh, when the market, the private funding market, uh, is strong enough and they start to pick up, I think the state funding should uh, sort of give the market to the private people or the private parties and, and not really uh, sort of a, a remain there. Because the, the worst part or the first thing that could happen with the public funding is that they actually maintain unhealthy companies. So they are like in uh, intensive care and uh, they just keep going and they get money and, and the resources are locked in there and they are not released for the better uh, business ideas or the better companies that, that uh, could be around there. So um, uh, I would say that uh, uh, there's no way, I, 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 I don't think anyone can tell any other country or any other area how uh, they, they should be doing their regulation or whatever. Every country is different. Uh, there is different history, background, uh, different kind of, uh, uh, let's say, business practices. So uh, I, I would basically encourage here, uh, you guys look around, uh, uh, do benchmarking with different countries, uh, look at the ideas, and then try to think yourself what are the ideas and the approaches that would work in your own, own specific uh, uh, situation. Because one, one key element is also the timing. So everyone would like to be the Silicon Valley, but those guys have been building it for 50 years. So uh, there's no way you can get there in uh, two or three years. Uh, uh, you have to uh, take the steps and, and, and sort of uh, uh, recognize where you are now 
and move uh, from there in a way that that really sort of uh, uh, makes sense and, and is uh, is sort of a, a, a healthy way of moving forward. Uh, thank you, Tapio. Uh, Thank you, Tapio. Uh, and I have a question to Tapio and to Dennis. Uh, and you mentioned uh, tax uh, topics. And we have two tax uh, uh, modes of operation. It's individual entrepreneurship. Uh, a physical person can be called an entrepreneur and plus 6% uh, only of. And uh, there are some limited liability companies which simplified uh, tax uh, and 9% uh, from dividends up to $2 million in turnover and they can allow to exist uh, under this uh, mode. And some entrepreneurs uh, use this because the tax burden is significantly less than if you pay value-added tax and profit tax. But in Lithuania, in Finland, do you have similar simplified tax uh, modes, tax regimes for uh, inter individual entrepreneurs and small businesses? And if they exist, what, the what is the level of this tax? We have uh, tax breaks uh, for uh, small companies uh, depending upon the phase of development and uh, turnover, but uh, it's linked to the profit tax uh, so that uh, we don't need to pay profit tax if uh, uh, the turnover is uh, less than 30,000 euros, uh, it's, well, uh, maybe one million, uh, oh, well, I don't start converting in rubles, but anyway, uh, it's about... Uh, uh, everybody knows yeah. what is 30,000 euro in yeah. Russia, <laughs> it's not so, a problem. So, but um, it's uh, also there are tax breaks uh, for a special type of uh, uh, companies uh, in order to foster uh, development of uh, startups. Uh, uh, a year ago, we launched a new form. It's called uh, a small partnership uh, where you can launch a company without a uh, share capital. And, um, and then you have uh, also uh, well, certain uh, uh, tax breaks. But uh, in Lithuania, business considers that uh, social welfare and healthcare uh, taxes uh, or work uh, employee taxes are the highest uh, burden because uh, they amount to about uh, well, 60% uh, of the salary of the uh, uh, personnel. So that's uh, the biggest uh, sort of issue or challenge uh, for our businesses. And uh, not so many people, uh, you know, complain about uh, profit tax or uh, income uh, taxes uh, in Lithuania. Uh, thank you, Dennis. What about Finland? Um, in Finland, we have the corporate tax rate is not 20%, and that applies to all the companies, no matter whether you are a big one or a small one. So in that sense, uh, if you make profits, uh, you, you do may pay taxes. But as I said, for, uh, for the startups, uh, the early years, most likely that you will not show profit, at least. So um, you, you can uh, play around a little bit with that. And then also there is the thing that if uh, and when you make losses, you can actually deduct the losses uh, from the coming years, I think up to five years later. So in that sense, uh, uh, most of the early stage startups uh, are first making losses, and then when they make profits, they can deduct their losses and, uh, and, and still uh, not pay. But do they pay VAT during this time? Uh, the VA, if you do business, the VAT taxes and uh, the, the loss there are uh, the same for everyone. And uh, we have the same situation as in Lithuania, that the biggest burden really for, for uh, the startups or any company in Finland is, is the, all the side costs related to labor. So uh, uh, retirement payments, social security payments, and then all kinds of uh, different insurances there. So uh, that, that's something which is not so good. Then one thing which is specific for startups is that um, uh, the ta uh, tax laws in Finland really don't uh, sort of recognize stock options or stocks the same way in, in many other countries they do. So if, if the startup gives stock options, uh, the taxman basically taxes you immediately, although in real terms the, the options are worthless, but they, they still somehow calculate a number and, and you have to pay for it. So uh, uh, that, that sort of takes that instrument out of the uh, toolbox uh, for the startups to uh, incentivize their employees. Thank you, Tepe. Я думаю, это следующий шаг, к которому мы придем. Thank you very much. I think we'll come to that eventually. And generally, our law does not is, is missing the concept of options, and we need to avoid the situation when the 
the concept is developed, but it will be very, very much taxed and nobody would like to use it. But now it is time for a questions and answers session, but I would like first to first draw a line under our discussion. Please raise your hands, those from other countries who, who is not from Russia. So we only have the most resilient people here staying at this regulating session. Uh, I would like to uh, say a couple of words and probably to, to try and inspire you open business in Russia because talking about taxes, our taxes are relatively small, like 30% of social tax, uh, social tax and 13% of income tax, so 6% turnover tax or revenue tax and 9% tax on income. This is quite this is quite a relaxed tax burden and whilst your revenue is still be below two million dollars then you are pay, paying simpler taxes. Good afternoon, Alexei Ulyanov, an expert from D Business Russia. And a question to Mr. Tsiganov, probably two or three questions. Federal Anti-Monopoly Service is investigating over 55,000 cases a year. Ten cases relate to violation of competition law, and 5,000 cases or 6,000 cases, they are about public servants. But the rest 4,000 is more than all other antitrust bodies in the whole world investigate in a year. So Russia looks like a total, total violator of the antitrust antitrust laws. So some of these cases, they refer to small and medium businesses. We know, we know cases when, when, when a car washer was declared a monopolist or a company was, there was a well-known case when people were renting, renting entertainment equipment in Zabaykalsk and they were declared monopolists. So we have 472 there's anecdotal cases and there's entertainment jumping equipment. I remember this case. So they had they had 50 ruble 50 ruble charge for the for 50 ruble charge and that was declared as the violation of antitrust law. So anti-monopoly service is opposing is opposing a law which will be introduced by the Minister of Economic Development, and this law is about getting small and medium businesses out of the scope of antitrust regulation responsibility. So, so this starts to work from down, uh, from down to the top. Five percent of all uh, anti-monopoly service resolutions have been cancelled by Russian courts last year, and 13% have been cancelled in 2013. I've recently read the interview of the head of Monopoly Service, and he called, he called the, the person who was providing the, that entertainment equipment, he called that person a trickster. Do you agree with this point of view? This is first question. The second question, 161 negative feedback entries are registered and reg uh, at registration.ru. A presidential council for encoding services has provided certain certain comments as well. And you also wanted to inter introduce certain rules for Russ Agro Company, and that those rules have been. Uh, those rules have been contested in court by the customers. However, the antitrust body have sided with the governmental company, and that ended up in having uh, the public loss of 4 billion rubles. However, the antitrust is motivating its, its actions with the fact that it is improving services. So the third question is, you must have misread the proposals of the Minister of Economic Development about get, getting out 
get, getting small and medium businesses out of the scope of antitrust. And what do we do with the boilers was one question. The boilers still stand, stay in your area of responsibility. And what do we do with big business who will try, who will have an incentive to create medium businesses? But if you take a closer look at the legislation, it's, it will show, it will show you, you will see that a small small trading house, which is more than 25% owned by a big company, then it is not regarded as a medium business. So small boilers in the regions, they remain in the, your area of responsibility and affiliate, companies affiliated to big big companies still remain in your area of responsibility. Do you believe that small businesses should not be regulated by antitrust? Those three questions were more like a speech, actually. Uh, generally, it was quite an inspiring speech, and Mr. Ulyanov should, in fact, have taken a seat of one of the speakers so that he could have given us more information about it. Let's not exchange comments, but there is one. Let's try to answer one question. Um, calling one person a trickster is a person can be called a trickster in line with the law. So if your actions fall into the category of a trickster, then you are a trickster. And the inventors are not, will not be regulated by antitrust bodies. It, it's not true, so it's a lie, and it is used. It is used for the. F it is used to try to oppose this legislation. It, it is absolutely clear that the owner of a big share or an owner of an inv invention is not a monopolist. Alexei, Alexei Sergeyevich was teaching in the university the competition law, and he, he should actually know that in Russia, nobody is against dominating in the market or nobody is against monopolies. There is one thing that which is actually forbidden, that's, misuse, that's abuse of your monopolistic power. When we do not allow generic generic drugs into the market of the country, is it, does it not constitute a violation? Or patents, for example, when people buy patents and then they lock them up and they do not let these companies to develop further, it is also against the interests of the people. So the intellectual property rights and competition, they should go together. And if you take a look at the experience of Western companies, countries and Western companies. Had there not been such liaison between these two things, there will be no multi-billion fines to Google and Microsoft, and there will be no multi-billion fines to those, comp to those people who forbid the entry of cheap drugs into the market of the company, like in Korea, for example, or in Italy. In Italy, Italy was fined for the amount which was more than it could actually gain from introducing this forbidding regulation. And as far as non-discriminative access to the market is concerned, non-discriminative access from our point of view can be used to natural monopolies and it can be used to other companies. It's like a servitude. And in the world civil law, there is a concept of servitude, and it was well known in, in Egypt, in fact. And this is, that meant that people could use certain, uh, certain things on, uh, on an equal basis. And it is not about establishing some specific conditions for certain companies. It is about the fact that the law will be used to determine the access to limited resources to all the people. 
So if we take a look at this non-discriminative access regulations, then we started from natural monopolies. Let's say there is a pipe, gas pipeline or there is a power transmission line. So, so we regulated these issues first. Then there is a third antitrust block of regulations. And now the third block of regulations that relates to owners of this infrastructure. And now if the company is sustainable and if the company is sustainably taking big share of the market and nobody is forecasting that the market share will reduce, then these companies should abide by certain rules. And there is, no, there is nothing dangerous in it. But the question was asked, do you support the idea of taking small and medium business out of the scope of responsibility of antitrust bodies? I think that the size of the company is an unjustified criteria for this. It's, like, it's the same like judging a business on the basis of the nationality of its director or some other factors. We are reviewing specific cases. If heads of small companies form a cartel and they, and they set certain prices and they agree on these prices before they go on a tender, this is subject to our regulations. If there is a local market and a small and 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 the mother with a child is not going to go out of that market to go so somewhere else they will be operating in this market and this market is also liable to re regulation limitation of competition so you will still be dealing with the very minor things like this granting of entertainment equipment This, this case is four, four years old already, and it is quite popular in specific mass media, and it is given as an example at certain forums. But we have actually taken a very close look into this case, and the courts have taken, have investigated this. And this case has now been stopped because it is insignificant. But I reiterate this point. That it is, was not the fact that there was no wrongdoing. It is the fact that it is insignificant. Probably you shouldn't, shouldn't look at these cases at all. Probably so. And we, uh, when our Western colleagues are talking about prioritizations, we, we like these things, actually. So they say that in this this season we are planning to focus on these areas and in other areas the situation is simpler so we're not going to focus on them our law not only anti-monopoly law but the law about administrative wrongdoings our law dictates that we respond in a certain way to specific actions and when we have a claim about something we have to respond to that Sometimes we talk to people about these things, and our opponents give us a figure. Let's say you are investigating 40,000 cases a year, but they forget another figure. Out of these, let's say, 80,000 cases of antitrust law violations, we get around 16,000 of complaints. Every complaint has to be scrutinized and checked and investigated. And we start the case, we crack the case open only if the, there is a basis for that. So when somebody doesn't agree with us, then he should take us to court. And I'm welcoming the practice when the courts in certain cases are giving, giving softer punishments or softer penalties because they have authority to soften the penalty and the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation made it obligatory for us to assess the economic position of the company which is facing penalties. I think everyone should be operating in the law-abiding format. Vladimir Zivulin from Minister of Economic Affairs will have to leave us shortly. 
but you can probably draw a line under our discussion and also a question. It is not actually a question. It's more, more like a comment. So we have heard a lot of interesting things and you have given us an insight into what the ministry is doing in terms of simplifying business environment. And I liked I liked, liked it a lot, but there is a thing, there's one thing, I've never heard of these things before you told, told it to us. This website, regulation.ru, how many people know that there is a way to leave comments there? I don't think that it is, it is a well-publicized issue. It will be good to see that all these things are publicized. Yes, it, it should be in the form of a, an ad on the TV. It would be good to have more information about it simply because people don't know it. This is a valid claim. I accept it. And apart from the fact that we are trying to, we are trying very hard to popularize these new technologies. But, but the case is that our people still do not have enough information. And I would like to point out one thing. To make these things well known to a lot of people and well known to many business participants, we have opened a web page in Facebook. So we mentioned YouTube and Twitter accounts here. And my presentation has got the internet address of our Facebook page and it contains the latest news about this procedure for assessing the, regula the impacts of regulations. But from our side, we'll try to think about other things we can do to make these actions more publicly known. And another thing, today, more than 500 companies act as our permanent partners. And so they directly participate in the assessment of regulatory impact, starting from air and space industry and finishing with bakeries, oil companies, metallurgy companies. They participate in these activities. But sometimes all their efforts is not enough to get the total picture of what the market thinks. So I suggest the following thing. If we have, if you have any ideas as to what else could be done to get more information in a better fashion to our entrepreneurs, well, you, I'd like to have your contacts actually, so that we can keep in touch. Um, but if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to to ask me. I apologize for leaving now before the end of the session, but it was a very interesting session. I thank you for that. And at least I can see that we have a lot of things in common. And unfortunately, the format of this session is not enough to discuss everything in more detail. Thank you very much, Vadim, for participating in it. And one more thing that I wanted to add in response to the comment whether our entrepreneurs know about the website regulation.gov.ru. As I noticed in the framework of roadmap discussion and some other panel discussions, we talk about regulations and federal laws and federal tax authority asked for a feedback about their new website. And the, text, the feedback about the website is more simple than just giving a feedback about the federal law. And we didn't get enough comments, in fact. Могла быть намного больше. Поэтому здесь такой двухсторонний процесс, который очень важен, очень нужен. У нас осталось всего несколько минут до конца. Да, Андрей, у вас есть реплика. Если можно, пока идет обмен визитками. Я... Uh, just a few words about it, and uh, I would like to, before uh, to do this, uh... It's not a promotion, but uh, uh, the issues related to SME uh, is uh, the focus of my 
activities in 25 years. And uh, the, the law, which uh, has appeared in the beginning of 90s, uh, was also written uh, with my participation. I am not uh, too modest about it, but quite, quite cynical. And looking back uh, uh, to, uh, to this, uh, if an entrepreneur says, how can how I know, how could I know about it? Uh, I didn't know that these regulations existed, but uh, it means that if a person goes into business, if you take commitments uh, for uh, the life of your family and you are not getting wages uh, every month and you are just uh, uh, fighting for your survival with uh, your uh, then you are obliged to know it. You need to follow all the risks which are around you in this complicated world where you have a lot of underwater rocks and the competitors and all kind of... Therefore, uh, you ne cannot just, you see, baber uh, these entrepreneurs, uh, uh, pamper them. So uh, my question is to our Lithuanian uh, uh, counterpart, uh, do you promote uh, uh, the laws and do you actually attract uh, businessmen uh, to participate in writing the laws? And if so, uh, what are the forms you have? Tools, uh, uh, but uh, one of the things that uh, it's inside uh, our administrative regulation that uh, we need to consult uh, business associations and uh, SME council uh, then uh, uh, new uh, laws or regulations related to businesses are being uh, uh, adopted. That's like uh, the direct, uh, the most natural uh, way uh, to get uh, accumulated opinion of a uh, whole range of uh, uh, businesses. And uh, all uh, legal acts and uh, the drafts uh, are uploaded uh, also online and uh, everyone can uh, uh, read them and uh, provide comments uh, or some uh, proposals. Uh, it's just that uh, I just wanted to make one note uh, that uh, regulation uh, it's uh, always you know, a matter of uh, maybe wide interests of different groups. Uh, like we had case uh, with uh, real estate brokers. Uh, the Real Estate Brokers Association, we wanted to pass a law in order to set uh, certain uh, qualification requirements uh, for anybody who wants to start uh, this business. And uh, our previous government, uh, with very liberal and uh, open market uh, orientation, we say, no, no way, you cannot do this, uh, because we want to ensure that anybody can start uh, this business, because uh, it will be cheaper for the consumers uh, uh, to use the services. But at the same time, there are some negative consequences that uh, uh, Association of uh, Real Estate Brokers say that uh, some taxes are being uh, evaded or hidden because there are one day uh, real estate brokers and, and so on. So you have to balance uh, what is more important uh, at this uh, given moment, uh, whether a business open competition or, you know, some uh, maybe more taxes, but that's the job of tax inspectorate on the other hand. So just a small remark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, also in Finland, of course, uh, I think you can find any law and, or any regulation in the web uh, just by searching for it uh, with any other search engines, more or less. Of course, the state agencies have their own websites where they publish uh, their work, and, and we have a similar uh, sort of way of working as in Lithuania that uh, uh, the businesses or the, any basically uh, party in the society, when uh, when the legislation or regulation has some impact on them, they, they are involved in, in the drafting of, of, of those documents. So um, I guess there is no magic there. I think uh, one key uh, word that was already mentioned was transparency. So uh, that, that's definitely something you should be thriving for. And, and uh, well, all the countries are in different stages on those. And, and, uh, but I think the direction here seems to be good. Thank you. Коллеги, у нас осталось 4 минуты до конца. Это означает, что время подвести итоги. Colleagues, we have only four minutes left. Uh, it's the time to sum up our discussion. I believe that we have made, come to two major conclusions. And the first one is that definitely we need to have a system of developing reforms because uh, those uh, chaotic actions uh, of uh, introducing separate laws uh, shall not uh, divide us 
uh, from uh, general perception of what's going on. And Vadim described us uh, the number of initiatives uh, ongoing and uh, whether they need so many. And who is uh, has this kind of uh, uh, idea of uh, generating endless uh, amount of new uh, rules and regulations? Therefore, I believe that the entire life cycle of uh, regulations uh, about uh, study who is the initiator of it, who is discussing it, who is uh, brings it to regulation that are you, who is arranging focus groups and who then uh, pr starts uh, commercials on TV. And um, we believe as in the car making industry, we need to even to think about how the disposal of uh, this item will happen. So this uh, a car will be later uh, uh, the, 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 this uh, disposed of, and therefore we need to understand uh, when the laws uh, actually is uh, uh, topical and when it is already outdated. Therefore, one in, two out, uh, it's a great uh, principle, and uh, it leads to simplification of this system. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, my first conclusion, uh, which I would like to underscore. And we uh, actually uh, treat it as a food for thought. And the second issue is communications. From what I heard uh, from our Russian hosts and uh, international guests, uh, communication is not just uh, put into effect a certain law, uh, but uh, to explain, to uh, promote awareness, uh, to uh, speak about it on TV, it is uh, quite ser serious. And I remember in New York, I opened a uh, 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 switched on TV and I saw uh, a commercial invest in New York, uh, 10 uh, years of operation tax free. And I came there to this site and then when I start reading all uh, these uh, references, then I saw that it's not absolutely tax free and not it is uh, for 10 years and the location is specified and the work uh, working slots is a mandatory condition then then uh, i understood that uh, for for our uh, setting this six percent tax is much more appealing but still i went to the site and i examined this issue therefore we need to do certain appealing steps to attract people to analyze and uh, to avoid this gap which we saw quite clearly uh, that uh, the businessman who would wish to take part in uh, developing of uh, a legislative environment, we need to uh, uh, to, to reduce this gap. And uh, I would like to thank our contributors for this one and a half hour of uh, fruitful discussions, uh, which were focused on bridging this gap. And I would like to thank everybody again.